down to his net. Uh, My name is Terry Shepard, and I will be your guide into the world of close quarter battle. I'm a current U.S. Army Green Beret, and I have fought in two armed conflicts in the Middle East. Initially, I was trained to fight in the European theater to protect the U.S. and its Western allies from the Soviet Union during the heart of a Cold War. As a Green Beret, I had to learn an Eastern Bloc language and be prepared to infiltrate behind enemy lines to link up with, train, and fight alongside partisans to defeat the Red Army in their very own backyard. In other words, I had to be really good at guerrilla warfare. Although the Cold War is technically over, we now face a new global conflict, terrorism. To combat this threat, I've got to be an expert in the techniques of close quarter battle. Together, we'll explore how elite soldiers and police units use these specific techniques, weapons and technologies to defeat their enemies at very close range. The term close quarter battle is used to describe scenarios that police and military face in both urban and rural environments. Although the origin of close quarter battle goes back to sword fighting and hand-to-hand -hand combat, today it's used primarily to describe the techniques when small teams are confronting an enemy inside a building or within a compound. Stairwells, hallways, and rooms always pose dangerous and unknown variables. From basic muzzle awareness, weapons transitions, to silent team communication, all police and military units need to be as good as they can possibly be at close quarter battle. Today, I will take a look at how private military contractors, or PMCs, conduct highly dangerous classified operations. I'll also compare the kit of a counterterrorism medic with what I carry in my own kit. My partner and I will show you you have to have the correct equipment to save a guy's life. And I will fire the FNP-90 personal defense weapon. And we also analyze our flow drills to better understand how a contracting team works as a unit. The term mercenary comes from the old French mercenaire and from the Latin mercenarius, which is derived from merces, meaning wages or price. The term was originally used to describe foreign soldiers hired outside of a national army. Although mercenary soldiers date back to ancient Egypt and throughout the Middle Ages, it was in the 19th and 20th centuries that we began to see the contemporary idea of the private soldier taking shape. A mercenary is basically a skilled warrior who is lending that skill for purely financial profit and has no patriotic interest in the outcome of a conflict. Now in the modern battlefields of Iraq and Afghanistan, the civilian contractor has become a normal part of the military experience. All facets of military work are being privatized. From the basic services of food and maintenance, all the way up to VIP protection and combat missions. There are even classified operations where there may be a desire to operate outside of a national defense system. It's estimated that almost 30% of the U.S. intelligence community comes from private sources. People hear the word contractors, they often think mercenaries. That's not really the case. Contractor is someone paid by the government to work in a supporting role in a combat zone. This could be a cook, a generator mechanic, or a gate guard. Now, the changing face of warfare in the last decade has called for a different kind of person. Someone with a unique skill set, often from the special operations community, that can work in jobs and complete missions that the U.S. military really doesn't have the time or the manpower to complete. Since 9-11, we have been fighting on asymmetric battlefields. That means there is no front. That also means there's no safe place at all. Someone coming, visiting into that area, a dignitary, a high-ranking officer, maybe even a performer in a USO show, they have to be protected. Most of these missions are defensive, but it's safe to say there are some that are offensive. Either way, if you want to succeed and survive doing this job, you better be good at CQB. When a team of private contractors are operating in a foreign battle zone, they're most often without the support of a larger military infrastructure. This has some advantages, as decisions can be made without the usual bureaucracy of larger militaries, 
but at the same time, it comes with its own set of problems and challenges. Whether you're a private military contractor working in diplomatic security, or a covert intel officer working directly for the CIA, you better be an expert in CQB. Private military contractor teams are often made up of ex-special forces operators from the international community. In the case of Iraq and Afghanistan, several international contracting companies were involved from the beginning of the conflicts in all aspects of operations, even in forward fighting roles. When operating as a PMC unit, you're often unsupported in the traditional military sense. So if something goes wrong, there is often no command structure or rescue force that can support you. Often, contractor teams in Iraq and Afghanistan worked in unmarked bulletproof vehicles where they had a specific high-value target that they needed to capture and turn over to the military or intelligence department. When traveling through the streets of a war zone, there is the potential for danger around every corner. In a contracting team, you have to have skilled dynamic drivers, weapons demolition and medical specialists, and everybody must be a skilled shooter. The principles of surprise, speed, and violence of action are used by PMC operators. They have to use speed as they travel and as they prepare to move in on a target. They have to maintain the element of surprise with a good route selection during the approach in order to catch the target unprepared for their arrival. They have to use intense but controlled violence of action as they overwhelm the target so they can keep the team members alive and be victorious in the fight. Now let's take a look at the futuristic looking personal defense weapon, the FN P90. The P90 was originally developed in the late 80s by the Belgium company Fabrique Nationale as a personal defense weapon. But tell us about this one. That's unusual. Uh, this is a FN P90 submachine gun. P90, okay. With the uh, bullpup system. Most systems, the magazine is in front of the whole trigger assembly. This, the bullpup is actually, that's behind it, okay? Yes, exactly. As you say, the chamber is at the back of the weapon. Right. So we have long barrel with yeah. the whole weapon. Right, yeah. right. In this type, the magazine is on the top. Yeah, that's unusual, man. It's really unusual. That's an interesting magazine. And uh, it has a big capacity with 50 rounds. 50 round mag? Yeah, 50 round mag. What's the caliber of that? This is 9 mil? What is that? Yeah, this is a caliber 5.7. So, more damage, bigger bullet? Yeah, uh, the bullet is a little lighter uh, with a high velocity yeah. and good penetration. Yeah, that's basically, that's, a, that's an assault rifle. Yeah. It's pretty much an assault rifle. But, but you know what's great about that? I mean, that's so darn short because of the way, the way it's configured with the magazine it's in the back. Short. Yeah, I actually look forward to firing it. I've never fired anything like that. That's cool. Can I try it? That's right. Yeah, Kui. I'm a lefty, so it's a little different. Yeah. It's so small, man. I mean, I. It's very small. Yeah, I can't. I can't wait. To, I can't wait to fire this thing. Boom. It's a nice little sight on there too, actually. Yeah. Yeah. The idea was to create a compact weapon that could fire in fully automatic mode and carry a high capacity magazine. NATO was requesting that companies develop a weapon using the 5.7 by 28 millimeter ammunition. The P90 has a unique bullpup design that features a top loading 50 round magazine. I like it because as a left handed shooter, the P90's ambidextrous design allows me to shoot without the shell casings flying right by my face. Sometimes it's the little things. Eject. Sometimes it happens with uh, this type of weapon. A lot of units has the same problem with P90s. So when they work great, they work great. They work but great. you sometimes have a malfunction. But I tell you, man, the training is it's funny. We both today had malfunctions, and both of us, the first thing we did was drop, stay in the gunfight, and survive. That was awesome work, man. Coming up, we compare my kit with a counterterrorism medical officer's gear, and we also analyze our flow drills to better understand how a contracting team works as a unit.
Close quarter battle is a term used to describe the training of combat in buildings, hallways, and rooms, but also how to control the elements of a firefight in small rural areas like compounds. Today, we're learning about private military contractors and how they operate as a team. The conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan have redefined what it is to be a private military contractor. These special operators need to be experts in CQB. Any team of private military contractors needs to have at least one person who is trained as a medic, and all the team members must have a good working knowledge of trauma medicine. As anyone in combat can tell you, sometimes the medic gets wounded, or you have to treat yourself if the situation dictates. As a Green Beret, one of my specialties is a field medic. Let's take a look at the difference between my basic military kit and the kit of this counterterrorism medic. Whether we like to admit it or not, but we do admit it, guys are gonna get hurt in CQB. So you need to deal with that. You need to train for it, you need to practice it over and over again, and you have to have the correct equipment to save a guy's life on the battlefield or in a house. This is really a, a really well set up tactical medic. He is outfitted for an urban operations. This is made of Nomex, which is a fireproof um, fabric. I see it a lot of flight suits. It is, this is a flight suit actually, patterned after a flight cruise. So it's fire retardant and also the pattern and color is perfect for working out in an urban environment. Right here, very, very um, available. Not even have to dig into a pouch. He's got two things that'll save a guy's life immediately for a life-threatening bleed. There's a tourniquet, it's called a cat tourniquet, combat applications tourniquet, it's very light, it's pretty darn durable, very easy to apply. So in the middle of a thing, he could, a fight, he could just go, I got it, and apply it. This is a pressure dressing. You can take this, it's got gauze on it, you can press it onto the wound, wrap it, it's almost like a combination ace wrap and uh, a gauze bandage. Both of these things are great for stopping bleeds and saving lives. He's got identifying unit patches right here. Again, A positive, awesome, RH factor. He's got a strobe. This is also IR. These are great. We always have one of these over here because this is for infiltrating, exfiltrating. He could put it on the IR setting so that the bad guys don't see him and the, and the uh, aircraft above know exactly where he is. Prevents a friendly fire incident, makes a link up very, very easy. There's our radio. He's got his Embitter radio behind, it's routed through. He's got a gas mask, because uh, the guys here at uh, Urna use gas a lot. They're police. They often use non-lethal ways to get into an objective. The MP5K model with an EOTech, that's the holographic sight, really nice. I really like those. He's got a bright light, a white light, a tack light, and he's also got the pistol grip with the switch. And here, uh, you have a Glock. This is the sign of someone who does a lot of CQB, especially in an urban environment. He's got a light already attached to his gun. And also, uh, penny cutter scissors. These things are actually pretty amazing. They will literally cut a penny. This is a really well-equipped tactical medic. Um, another thing to think about here, though, too, everything he has, in one degree or another, most operators can or should have. Everyone's got to have tourniquets. Everyone's got to have uh, pressure dressings. Of course, they have all their fighting gear. And uh, really, just as importantly, is everybody needs to be trained in it because he may be the one who, unfortunately, gets shot or hurt and his operator friends, his, his operator brothers, have to work on him. When a team is entering a building or structure, the critical and most vulnerable time is right as they enter, right at what we call the breach point. When drilling and training for CQB, it's essential to work with your partner and other team members to rehearse how you will move into and throughout a potential target. We set our basic obstacle course into a doorway with unknown friendly and enemy targets inside so that we can test how to maximize and control our firepower and move as a team through the CQB scenario. Stop. What you saw right there was a signal process that these guys have been practicing. The lead man halted the formation. He could have done this back there. He could have done this right at the door. He's the one seeing this right up front. In this case, he halted the formation. That's kind of the universal signal for freeze. As Soon as he did that, that gets passed back to the rear. And the rear man, he makes sure he's ready to go, and he puts his hand on the shoulder of the guy in front of him and squeezes. This also minimizes talking. He does the same thing. He feels the squeeze, cool. He makes sure his gear's squared away and he's ready to go. Passes it up to this guy, and he finally passes it up to the number one man. He knows now we're ready to rock. He's gonna move them forward. Go. Stop. This is a good time to stop and see what's going on here. 
Look at number one man. He's scanning his front with his long gun. Once he sees the door where they're gonna enter, he owns it. He never takes his eyes off of it. Number two is actually in support of him. You notice he's right on his butt. And basically, wherever the one man goes, he can go the other way, and they're starting to get a nice range fan to, to cover their angles. In general, number three is the breacher. He carries the explosive charge, or in this case, this big scary cat has this, what we call the hooligan tool, so if the charge doesn't work, he can rip down the door with this. The last guy, in this case, we have number four. He's pulling rear security. So these guys have a 360 degree protection of guns going everywhere. It doesn't really stop, even until you go to the door, and even when you go inside. All right, so we're about at the end of our training day, and we've decided to ramp it up a little bit more. What we've done now is added some targets that require them to be very discriminatory. All right, so the first team did a pretty good job. They had a couple of technical difficulties in the beginning. They totally overcame them. Most importantly, they killed all the targets they were supposed to kill, and they took some really long shots at the hostage one and nailed it. So let's go to the second team. Go! There was some hesitation when they came in the door. That could happen. Uh, here's what's important. They had a couple of misses on some targets, but the really important ones, like this bad guy right there and the hostage one, they did not kill a good guy, and they, and they and, and neutralized the bad guy. So uh, that's a successful uh, uh, training mission, and it's also a lot of fun. Coming up. We take a look at some of the kit that both military and private military contractors need to use. We'll also get to witness the conclusion of our contractor scenario. You are clear to engage. Over. CQB, or close quarter battle, is a term used to describe conflict in urban areas and small compounds that involve movement inside and around buildings, hallways, and small rooms with unknown variables. Today, we're learning about private military contractors and how they use CQB. Let's take a look at what kind of equipment and weapons a private military contractor uses. First thing you notice about a PMC operator is that he usually wears a lighter kit compared to a regular soldier. He often has to trade in protection for maneuverability. Here we see he's wearing a baseball hat and sunglasses for tactical shooting in harsh sunlight. As his primary weapon, he's carrying a classic M4 rifle with extra magazines, and as a secondary weapon, a Glock, also with extra mags. This operator also has a field medical pouch attached to the tactical vest. This is a tactical plate carrier, which features the Molly system to enable easy attachment of extra pouches and equipment. You can also see a radio pouch positioned on the side of his vest. Unlike a regular soldier, this PMC operator is wearing civilian hiking style boots and pants, again for ease of maneuverability and also to lower the military signature. Finally, any operator needs to have a good set of tactical gloves. Let's take a closer look at these tools of the trade and get our hands on some of this tactical gear to better understand how it supports close quarter battle. Let's go to this. This is an old school Kevlar helmet. We call it the K-Pot. It's got a desert cover, wide uh, ear cups for ventilation. It's got a decent suspension system. It is capable of stopping frags and even some small bullets. Now we've come a long way since then. We've got some helmets and special forces that have cutaway ears for our headsets, better ballistic capability. They've got rail systems on the side to mount lights and, and night vision devices. Uh, it's amazing what we've come with this, but this is not a bad start. This could potentially save your life. 
And of course, you have to have a set of ballistic goggles. Ballistic meaning it can stop fragments. Just stuff comes out your eyes all the time, whether it's demolition, certainly in CQB, there's stuff flying everywhere. Not the least of which is dust and grime from blowing things up and moving. That can really bother you. You need goggles. You gotta have gloves, man. Your hands are gonna get shredded. Especially doing CQB when you're coming through a building like this. There's glass, there's, there's concrete. This leather has been treated, so it's actually got a bit of a grippy, sticky surface, almost like a, a wide receiver glove. These are by Blackhawk, and the front is actually a really interestingly treated leather. It's got a nice grippy dot surface, which is important, almost like a wide receiver glove, with pads in key areas. And on the back, there's pads also for all the knuckles. This is like a durability area. And here, there's a hard surface. Getting in and out of a vehicle is, is you just cut your hands a lot. Coming over a window jam doing CQB, it's very easy to cut your hands. Finally, some knee pads. When you spend a lot of time kneeling in an aircraft or a vehicle or working in an environment like this where you're constantly going down and getting back up your knees, totally take a beating. And the older you get, the worse it is. So these are great to have. Most guys I know, I know wear knee pads on an assault or any kind of air operation. They're really light. These ones are by Black Hawk. They've got non-stick skid surfaces front and back so it doesn't ride up as much on your knee. But at the end of the day, all this stuff is just nylon. It's just gear. What matters is the, is the guy using it. But when you get really good gear that's crafted the smart way and listen to your needs, you meld that with the shooter, now you've got someone who's really good. Let's examine how a PMC team extracts a high value target in potentially dangerous surroundings. As the team approaches, the vehicle stops and lets part of the team out to advance, maintaining surprise. One member of the team keeps a watch on the exterior of the target building. The team vehicle repositions for extraction. As the entry team finds and identifies the target inside, they move back out towards the exit. They signal the exterior man, who is watching the perimeter of the building, and move the subject out and into the vehicle. The entire team mounts up and exfills the area. However, the mission is not over. They still gotta make it out to a safe area to offload their precious cargo. Coming up, we take a look at the conclusion of our private military contractor scenario. By with weapons, you are cleared to engage. Over. Close Quarter Battle, or CQB, describes the challenges faced by special forces and police when engaging an enemy inside a building with hallways and rooms. This team of elite private military contractors is on the hunt for a high-value target in a known area. They arrive in an armored vehicle and approach discreetly toward the building in a tactical, combat-ready formation. The team splits up and uses the vehicle as cover so that when they exit, they can have a firing position if needed. Inside the building, they have to identify and subdue the target. Now that the target is retrieved, they have to maintain situational awareness as they move toward the second extraction point and prepare the target for airlift. Unlike a military unit, private military contractors often have to operate completely autonomous from conventional forces. This requires even greater situational awareness as they conduct operations. If things go badly, they might not have anyone who can come to assist them. This gives contractors some freedom to operate, but also means they have to be a tightly coordinated team that operates very well on its own. Today, we learned how private military contractors work on classified missions to extract highly dangerous targets inside a war zone. We also learned about how their equipment is different from regular military equipment. And then I fired the futuristic looking P90 personal defense weapon. Whether you're in the military or working as a contractor, you better have a well-developed skill set 
And on today's battlefields, that skill set always includes CQB.